Okay. If you would open the book to page five, please. Is that the one you So a little bit of context. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, author of Between the World and Me, um, is a journalist and writer. He is a um, predominant voice in black American uh, culture, um, an activist. He's written for The Atlantic. He's written in The New York Times. Um, as I stated a couple months ago, the title Between the World and Me comes directly from The Soul of Black Folks by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, du Bois talks about that in the opening chapter um, when he's talking about that idea of the veil between the world and me. There's a separation, this disconnect. Um, so you could see this as kind of a modern retelling, the retelling a hundred years later of Du Bois' book um, and how the problem, you know, the problem of blackness is still a um, hundred years later hasn't been solved. In fact, it's, it's mutated, it's changed um, in forms. You'll also notice on page five, the first word is son. This is written as a letter to his 15-year-old son, um, who he will address more directly later on in the reading today. So anytime that he talks about you or your, he's speaking directly to his son, but it's also meant to kind of evoke um, empathy within us which is one of the benefits of writing in epistolary form, writing in letters. Um, those of you who read The Color Purple, you're now very familiar with a novel in letter form, right? Celie in that book is writing letters to God about her life and what is going on. Um, writing in letters makes everything more personal. Right? It allows the writer to be more personal. It allows us, the reader, to be more empathetic with what is being said compared to a more traditional third-person narrator separated linear chronology type of narrative. Um, it also allows for a looser structure than a traditional novel would. A traditional novel, you're bound by time and thought. Right, You usually have to tell things in some sort of chronological, whether it be disjointed or linear um, narrative, whereas in a letter form, you can kind of jump around a little bit more. You can move from topic to topic as long as you're still connected by thought. Okay, So here we go, page five. Sun. Thank you. The Sunday, last Sunday, the host of a popular news show asked me what it meant to lose my body. The host was broadcasting from Washington, D.C., and I was seated in a remote studio on the far west side of Manhattan. A satellite closed the miles between us, but no machinery could close the gap between her world and the world for which I had been summoned to speak. When the host asked me about my body, her face faded from the screen and was replaced by a scroll of words written by me earlier that week. Lose my body. The word lose denotatively means what? What does it mean to lose something? Displace it. You displace it. Can't find it. Can't find it. It's no longer in your possession, right? Connotatively, what are some meanings we apply to the word lose that aren't necessarily part of the definition? There's sadness, right? Um, I also think like involuntary, maybe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, well, yeah, we never mean to lose something, right? Yeah, I guess. It's not like, oh, thank goodness I lost my keys today. I was really hoping I'd do that, right? I, I don't know, you, you talk about like trying to lose a person, like, I guess. That's true, yeah. No, I'd agree with you there. But typically we, we associate, yeah, you're right. 
there's a helplessness associated with it, right? If you're someone who has lost your keys, you have like a doctor's appointment or a date or something, or you got to get to school and you're like, where are my keys? There's a helplessness and almost a panic sometimes applied for that because we never realize we've lost something until we need it, right? At this point right now, there's any number of things that you might have lost, misplaced and are now, bless you, lost. But because you don't know about it, it's not lost. Nothing is ever lost till you need it. So thinking about the denotative and then the connotative meanings of lose. What does it mean to lose your body? My thought was that he's probably like in some kind of accident, and like, like I would think maybe you know you were like in a wheelchair for a few months or something, and like you could no longer utilize like you lost your body. Mm -hmm. So on a denotative level, lose my body could mean you know, some sort of accident or something happened where you no longer have the ability to, you know, to walk or to use your arms or something like that. You could have, like, lost control of his body. Like, he did something he wasn't 100% wanting to do. He did it because he was too angry or something like that. Okay, so an emotion, emotion kind of took over. Some sort of uh, primal urge took over, and he lost control of the body. I would argue in both those cases, though, the loss describes something else associated with the body. That in, in, in your case, it would be losing control. In your case, it would be losing an ability. If you lost your body, what would that mean? Which means you're dead, right? But of course, since consciousness is tied to life or death, we would never know we lost our body. So this is a really foreign concept when we're trying to think of it in a denotative sense. It doesn't make sense, right? Because like I said before, we never know we've lost something until we're looking for it. It's not like we wake up in the morning and we're like, holy crap, where'd I put my body? Right? And we're just like this floating aura around the room, like, did I leave it under the bed again? I always put my body under there. What's wrong with me? Is that not what you do? I'm not going to say whether it is or not. <laughs> so that means we have to apply connotation to this phrase to figure out what Coates is talking about. So thinking of those connotations we came up with, what do you think he means by lose my body? You've lost control of it. You are no longer in ownership. You are not in charge of it. It is out of your possession. So we associate feelings of guilt, feelings of loss, feelings of helplessness, right, of panic with that. And he's going to elaborate on that a little bit in the next paragraph. Here we go. The host read these words for the audience, and when she finished, she turned to the subject of my body, although she did not mention it specifically. But by now, I am accustomed to intelligent people asking about the condition of my body without realizing the nature of their request. Specifically, the host wished to know why I felt that white America's progress, or rather the progress of those Americans who believe that they are white, was built on looting and violence. Hearing this, I felt an old and indistinct sadness well up in me. The answer to this question is the record of the believers themselves. The answer is American history. So he starts out this paragraph by saying, almost every time that he is interviewed by somebody about this phrase, lose my body, there's a misinterpretation, right? There's focus on the more denotative meaning and not on the figurative meaning based on connotation. So he is often having to explain what he really means by lose my body because reporters are focused on 
Well, what does that phrase mean? And now what does it mean? Okay. And then once he explains what he's talking about, that it's the idea of his own, um, his own self-control, his ability to live and function as a person, then his, the question inevitably turns to, well, why do you think America's history of violence has led to that? What makes you believe that? And his answer is, well, it's right there in your history. If anybody has kept a good record about how, you know, white society or perceived white so society has taken ownership away from colored people, it's right there in our history. So that's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> Going on. There's nothing extreme in this statement. Americans deify democracy in a way that allows for a dim awareness that they have, from time to time, stood in defiance of their God. But democracy is a forgiving God, and America's heresies, torture, theft, enslavement, are so common among individuals and nations that none can declare themselves immune. In fact, Americans, in a real sense, have never betrayed their God. When Abraham Lincoln declared in 1863 that the Battle of Gettysburg must ensure, quote, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth, unquote, he was not merely being aspirational. At the onset of the Civil War, the United States of America had one of the highest rates of suffrage in the world. The question is not whether Lincoln truly meant government of the people, but what our country has, throughout its history, taken the political term people to actually mean. In 1863, it did not mean your mother or your grandmother, and it did not mean you and me. Thus, America's problem is not its betrayal of government of the people, but the means by which the people acquired their names. Walk me through that. <clears throat> Explain that paragraph, restate it. What's he talking about? Let me step in here. Okay. So you're right on. <clears throat> in America, we love democracy, right? Celebrated every July 4th. 
any sort of political campaign it's about democracy how great democracy is we're the you know most powerful democratic nation in the world blah 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 right to the point where we we worship it it is everything that we believe we pay homage to the almighty democracy But what he's saying is it's not truly a democracy and hasn't been. And he points to the Civil War. Civil War, right, the turning point for our country. Forget about the Revolutionary War. Forget about World War I, World War II. The Civil War changed the entire highway, the path that the United States was on. North versus South, right? At the Battle of Gettysburg, Abraham Lincoln says, of the people, for the people, by the people, referring to the government, that this cannot be erased from the face of the earth. What Coates is saying is that that was really never in jeopardy. In fact, at the time, the United States was the most democratic. It had the most suffrage, meaning more people had the opportunity to vote than any other country on the planet. So he's saying that that idea of democracy was never in jeopardy. Where Lincoln got it wrong was people. And we know this to be true, right? three-fifths compromise, slavery in and of itself. Once, two years later, the Emancipation Proclamation happens, Jim Crow era, where African Americans are treated worse probably than when they were slaves. Up to civil rights, we still haven't given any sort of real rights to Native Americans. Women didn't get the right to vote until the 20s and 30s. So the problem isn't that democracy was in jeopardy. Democracy was never in jeopardy. The problem is, who is it democracy for and by and of? That's the problem he's talking about. <clears throat> Going on, this leads us to another equally important ideal, one that Americans simply implicitly accept, but to which they make no conscious claim. Americans believe in the reality of race as a defined indubitable feature of the natural world. Racism, the need to ascribe bone deep features to people and then humiliate, reduce and destroy them inevitably follows from this inalterable condition. In this way, racism is rendered as the innocent daughter of Mother Nature, and one is left to deplore the Middle Passage or the Trail of Tears the way one deplores an earthquake, a tornado, or any other phenomenon that can be cast as beyond the handiwork of men. Race is a construct. Race is something that we have created. And it's not a real thing. Besides color of skin and maybe some physical differences, there is no difference between somebody born and raised here and any other place on the globe. But yet, we especially in America, have to put a label on people, right? What race are you? Where are you from? What do you look like? And that's not a real thing. So he says the problem number one is that we believe in this idea of race. And that from that comes racism. That, okay, you have group A, group B, group C. Each one has these features, right? 
I look like group A. So I am not like groups B or C. And those group B people, they're all like this. Those group C people, they're all like this. And my group is better than both of them, well, because we don't have those differences. Look at us here in group A. And we're supposed to look around, believing in race, and go, yeah, scientifically proven, right? African Americans are more susceptible to sickle cell, anemia, sickle cell anemia. Yeah, we're better than them, right? They have different facial features than me. Makes them look weird, right? People from Southeast Asia, it's with their eyes, different, right? This is what we do, and we just use that as an excuse to treat people differently. And we think of it, no, we don't blame ourselves for racism any more than we blame the earth for an earthquake. Right? Earthquake hits off the coast of Oregon, 4.0 magnitude the other night. We didn't all get out and like stomp on the ground because we're mad at the earth, right? How dare you? What are you doing? Right? Aftermath of a hurricane. People don't go out and like start throwing stones in the air, mad at the wind. People don't take a baseball bat and hit the ocean when there's flooding. Crazy people do. <laughs> I'm not going to say nobody does. Crazy people do. But that's what he's saying. This is the same way we view race and racism. That it's just an inevitable one from the other. And nothing we can do about it. It just happens. Right? You got different people, I'm going to make fun of you for being different. But we're not. We are not different. We are the same species. Go ahead and hate parrots. Great. Hate them because they're small and they're smelly and they like swoop down and eat things. <laughs> hate spiders because they're creepy crawly and leave sticky webs everywhere. Great. But hating somebody because like their hair is different than yours, that's just dumb. Because it's not a scientific thing. Because I guarantee you, going back to that ABC metaphor, the people in group A are like, oh, we're all unique individuals. We're not all the same. And then look at group B and go, y'all the same. Group C, you definitely all the same. Us, we're unique. Going on. But race is the child of racism, not the father. So he's saying that idea that, well, because there's race, there's going to be racism is backwards. We created race because of our racism. And the, progress, the process of naming the people has never been a matter of genealogy and physi physiognomy, so much as one of hierarchy. Difference in hue and hair is old, but the belief in the preeminence of hue and hair, the notion that these factors can correctly organize a society and that they signify deeper attributes which are indelible. This is the new idea at the heart of these new people who have been brought up hopelessly, tragically, deceitfully to believe that they are white. These new people are, like us, a modern invention. But unlike us, their new name has no real meaning divorced from the machinery of criminal power. The new people were something else before they were white, Catholic, Corsican, Welsh, Mennonite, Jewish. And if all our national hopes have any fulfillment, then they will have to be something else again. Perhaps they will truly become American and create a nobler bias for their myths. I cannot call it. As for now, it must be said that the process of washing the disparate tribes white, the elevation of believing in being white, was not achieved through wine tasting and ice cream socials. 
but rather through the pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land, through the flaying of backs, the chaining of limbs, the strangling of dissidents, the destruction of families, the rape of mothers, the sale of children, and various other acts meant, first and foremost, to deny you and me the right to secure and govern our own bodies. That's a damning set of paragraphs. There wasn't a white race until light-skinned people decided, oh, this is dark-skinned people. <sighs> mm, I don't know about them. I don't know about them. Because those of you who are religious probably have a little bit of a prejudiced view of other religions, right? If you're Catholic, you're like wary of Protestants and their rock bands, and they're wearing, <laughs> wearing jeans to church and standing up and speaking in tongues and things like that. If you're Baptist, you probably don't like the rigidity, uh, how rigid Catholicism is. It's old fashioned, right? They're all child molesters, right? You seen the movie Gangs of New York? Set late 1800s, late 1800s New York. It wasn't black gang versus Hispanic gang versus white gang. It was a whole bunch of white groups going at each other, right? Until one day, all of those white groups fighting with each other were like, wait, 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 wait! That guy's really dark. <laughs> Let's hate him. Yeah. Right? That's what this is. There is no white race. Everybody who is light skinned, you could line us up and we will each have a different pigment. I have much tanner skin than my wife. We're both white somehow. Some of you who are light-skinned have a darker hue than me. Some of you have a lighter one. But we're all white. And how did we come to create this race called white? Where do white people come from? Thank you, Mr. Decker, for teaching. <laughs> How did we come upon this? Through violence. Right? How did the white race come to power? Winning wars. Through violence. Through enslavement. Through pillaging. All of the things he talked about in that paragraph. That's how we got power. Going on. <clears throat> the new people are not original in this. Perhaps there has been at some point in history some great power whose elevation was exempt from the violent exploitation of other human bodies. If there has been, I have yet to discover it. But this banality of violence can never excuse America because America makes no claim to the banal. America believes itself exceptional the greatest and noblest nation ever to exist, a lone champion standing between the white city of democracy and the terrorists, despots, barbarians, and other enemies of civilization. One cannot at once claim to be superhuman and then plead mortal error. I propose to take our countrymen's claims of American exceptionalism seriously, which is to say, I propose subjecting our country to an exceptional moral standard. This is difficult. Because there exists all around us an apparatus urging us to accept American innocence at face value and not to inquire too much. 
And it is so easy to look away, to live with the fruits of our history and to ignore the great evil done in all our names. But you and I have never truly had that luxury, I think you know. America sees itself as a superhero, right? America is the country that is the most democratic, like we've said before, you know, champions the working class, blah, 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 claims to be exceptional. The problem is, this isn't the golden age of comics anymore. If you know your comic book history, old comics, 30s, 40s, 50s, about to the mid 60s, the golden age. If you've ever read them, superhero comics, they're so boring. The superhero is very one, maybe two dimensional, always does what is right, always strong, always brave. Right? There's a clear bad guy who comes out and states that they're a bad guy and they're going to do bad guy things. The superhero swoops in and uses their exceptionalism to right the wrong, save the day, right? It's not the audience anymore. If you saw Man of Steel, that's the problem brought out at the end. That is the central um, theme of Batman versus Superman, if you've seen that one. Yes, Superman saves the world by defeating General Zod. But in doing so, he destroys Metropolis. Hundreds, thousands, millions of lives are lost. Same thing happens in the Avengers. Right? So we can't deify Superman. We can't deify the Avengers and ignore their flaws. People died. And yes, I'm talking about a fictional, you know, fictional universes. But people died. And that's what America is doing by championing by champion championing ourselves as the greatest superpower in the world, as this bastion of everything that is good and right, by ignoring the terrible things we do, by shrugging at them, we're not proving ourselves to be a superhero. And Coates says we should, but we have to have that golden age morality all-inclusive, all-loving, asking for forgiveness for our sins. And as he'll point out in a little bit, taking the steps to right those wrongs. Shrugging your shoulders and saying, sorry, is not enough. Going on. I write you in your 15th year. Remember, this is a letter to his son. I am writing you because this was the year you saw Eric Gardner choke to death for selling cigarettes. Because you know now that Renisha McBride was shot for seeking help, that John Crawford was shot down for browsing in a department store. And you have seen men in uniform drive by and murder Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old child whom they were oath-bound to protect. And you have seen men in the same uniforms pummel Marlene Pinnock, someone's grandmother, on the side of a road. And you now know, and you know now, if you did not before, that the police departments of your country have been endowed with the authority to destroy your body. It does not matter if the destruction is the result of an unfortunate overreaction. It does not matter if it originates in a misunderstanding. It does not matter if the destruction springs from a foolish policy. Sell cigarettes without the proper authority and your body can be destroyed. Resent the people trying to entrap your body and it can be destroyed. 
turn into a dark stairwell and your body can be destroyed. The destroyers will rarely be held accountable. Mostly, they will receive pensions. And destruction is merely the superlative form of a dominion whose prerogatives include frisking, detainings, beatings, and humiliation. All of this is common to black people, and all of this is old for black people. No one is held responsible. There is nothing uniquely evil in these destroyers, or even in this moment. The destroyers are merely men enforcing the whims of our country, correctly interpreting its heritage and legacy. It is hard to face this, but all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. Of everything in this book, that last paragraph is probably the most important. No matter how we discuss race in the United States, if we must discuss race in the United States until there's a fundamental seismic shift in thought, it's much easier to talk about it in statistics. Violence here is up this amount. Oh, it's down this month. This percentage of people are murdered by the police. This percentage of police interactions result in police being shot. And we use statistics, numbers, graphs, charts, to hide from the fact that that's a body on the ground. It's much easier to look at a chart than to see blood pouring out of a gaping gunshot wound or to hear the crack of a bone as somebody is hit with a billy club. And that's something we all understand, right? I don't want to see anybody shot. I don't want to see anybody dying or dead on the ground somewhere. I could talk all day about how violence for this group has gone down 17% in the last eight years. That's easy to talk about. That's clinical. That keeps me away from it. But that's not the reality. Every one of those numbers is a person. A person who that day woke up Loved, hated, and did a million things. Ate, went to the bathroom, sneezed, blew their nose, just like we did today. Everybody sneezed and blew their nose today. If you didn't, you're not human. I'm, I'm racist against people who don't sneeze. <laughs> it's true. I've created a race. Sneezers. What I don't like about no sneezing people is you can't trust them. Like Never could. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you sneeze all the time, right? Wait, uh, don't get me wrong. I have lots of no sneezing friends. <laughs> lots of friends who don't sneeze. Just saying, I wouldn't trust them with my kids. So we use, we use these clinical expressions of a real problem, and we do it to hide the fact that there's a problem. And we refuse to do anything about it. There is no accountability is what Coates is saying. And statistically, we know that's true. To go back to statistics. Less than 2% of any, any use of deadly police force will result in even a con, uh, an, uh, charges brought against the police officer. Less than 2%. And even less than that in an actual conviction of any kind.
<laughs> and not to pile on the police, but like Coates says, the police are the people charged to enforce the ideas, the ideals, the morality of our country. The laws in place, they are charged to uphold. And all they're doing is they are reflecting what has been policy, unwritten policy, for hundreds of years. And until there's a change, it's going to stay the same. <clears throat> that Sunday, with that host on that news show, I tried to explain this as best I could within the time allotted. But at the end of the segment, the host flashed a widely shared picture of an 11-year-old black boy tearfully hugging a white police officer. Then she asked me about hope, and I knew then that I had failed, and I remembered that I had expected to fail. And I wondered again at the indistinct sadness welling up in me. What exactly, why exactly was I sad? I came out of the studio and walked for a while. It was a calm December day. Families believing themselves white were out on the streets. Infants raised to be white were bundled in strollers. And I was sad for these people. Much as I was sad for the host and sad for all the people out there watching and reveling in a specious hope. I realized then why I was sad. When the journalist asked me about my body, it was like she was asking me to awaken her from the most gorgeous dream. I have seen that dream all my life. It is perfect. It is perfect houses with nice lawns. It is Memorial Day cookouts, block associations, and driveways. The dream is tree houses and the Cub Scouts. The dream smells like peppermint but tastes like strawberry shortcake. Notice that dream is now capitalized. What is he making an allusion to? The American dream and? Hakeem Olajuwon, the African dream, yes. <laughs> Think Martin Luther King Jr. I said And for so long I have wanted to escape into the dream, to fold my country over my head like a blanket. But this has never been an option because the dream rests on our backs, the bedding made from our bodies. And knowing this, knowing that the dream persists by warring with the known world, I was sad for the host. I was sad for all those families. I was sad for my country. But above all, in that moment, I was sad for you. That was the week you learned that the killers of Michael Brown would go free. The men who had left his body in the street like some awesome declaration of their invi inviolable power would never be punished. It was not my expectation that anyone would ever be punished. But you were young and still believed. You stayed up till 11 p.m. that night, waiting for the announcement of an indictment. And when instead it was announced that there was none, you said, I've got to go. And you went to your room, and I heard you crying. I came in five minutes after, and I didn't hug you, and I didn't comfort you, because I thought it would be wrong to comfort you. I did not tell you that it would be okay, because I have never believed it would be okay. What I told you is what your grandparents tried to tell me that this is your country, that this is your world, that this is your body, and you must find some way to live within the all of it. I tell you now that the question of how one should live within a black body, within a country lost in the dream, is the question of my life, and the pursuit of this question I have found ultimately answers itself. We will stop there.